Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Berry. I'm a professor here at the university. I want to welcome you to the University of Chicago, to the Harris School. We're really thrilled to be hosting this event today and to welcome the inspector, the Council of Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency, which I'm told is SIGI. So welcome, SIGI. Uh, this is a really a great pleasure for us to be hosting you because in so many ways, what we are endeavoring to do at the Harris School and what you all are doing every day is very much in harmony. The Harris School for many years has been committed to using data and rigorous analysis to inform policy making, and we're uh, you know, kind of committed to that idea in our motto, which you may see there, social impact down to a science. And meanwhile, so many inspectors general are engaged in this kind of activity every day, using data and rigorous analysis in their own way. You're focused on making sure that government is not wasteful, that it's ethical, and that government resources are effectively used for the public good. Uh, I recently had occasion to be acquainted with the inspectors general personally, uh, not in a bad way, uh, it, it turns out, but I've been doing research for a couple of years on property taxes here in Cook County and did some research showing that property assessments were inaccurate and unfair, that lower priced homes were being systematically overassessed compared to high priced homes, that as a result billions of dollars in taxes were being shifted from the top 10% of people onto the bottom 90 percent and uh, you know the assessor is a powerful figure here in Cook County or was um, he was the head of the Cook County Democratic Party he had many friends throughout the city and in Springfield many politically connected tax lawyers who were his main donors and yet uh, the Tribune wrote a series of stories exposing these problems front page stories for several days and I have to say one of the very first people that I heard from when these stories broke was from the Inspector General of Cook County, Pat Blanchard, who immediately lost his own investigation into these issues. And I should say that this wasn't the first time that Inspector Blanchard had tangled with the assessor. He had some earlier work that he had done uh, had led to some legal cases that made the data available for us to do our work in the first place. And if it hadn't been for that, many of, this would, many of these activities would still be hidden. In any case, as a result, in March of this year, the inspector, who, as I said, was the chair of the Democratic Party, nevertheless lost the Democratic nomination for assessor. And in November, just a few days ago, uh, his challenger became elected as the new assessor and will take office uh, in a few weeks. And I have to say, after all that, you know, I'm exhausted and never would want to be involved in anything like that ever again. And yet I recognize that this is the sort of quiet and thankless work that inspectors general do every single day. And uh, thank you for it. And we're so delighted to be here to celebrate that work today. Um, it is uh, the right occasion to do so. This is 40 years after President Carter signed the law that created inspectors general. At the time of signing this law, President Carter called inspectors general, quote, perhaps the most important new tool in the fight against fraud. And he charged Inspector General to always remember that their ultimate responsibility was not to any individual, but to the public interest. And we are here today to celebrate that work. And for those of you who are not in this community, to, to learn more about what inspectors general do. So thank you all for attending. And I will now turn the podium over to someone who needs uh, no introduction, uh, Carol. Thanks to Harris uh, and the staff here that have helped us put this program together. My name is Carol Ochoa, and I'm the Inspector General for the General Services Administration. As Chris said, this year marks the 40th anniversary of the Inspector General Act, which President Jimmy Carter signed into law on October 12, 1978. The Inspector General Act established the first 12 presidentially appointed inspectors general in federal departments and agencies and empowered them to detect and prevent fraud, waste, and abuse and to promote efficiency and economy in government operations. And in the 40 years since, the inspector general community or IG community has grown to include 73 inspectors general across the federal government who collectively oversee the operations of nearly all, all aspects of government. Throughout this year, we have been commemorating the 40th anniversary by 
hosting events like this uh, across the nation to educate communities about the role of inspectors general and the nature of our work. It's our honor to be here to, tonight with you at the University of Chicago. What we'd like to do is discuss our work with you and perhaps start a conversation with those of you who are interested in learning more. As it turns out, Chicago is the home to 25 offices of inspector generals with nearly 500 auditors, special agents, attorneys, evaluators, and support staff working to fulfill our mission. Tonight, you'll hear from two current IGs who will tell you about recent important work, as well as other esteemed panelists from here at the University of Chicago and from our Inspector General community. We'll be describing in detail work that we've done recently in the nature of public safety, uh, work that may well have affected every one of you here in this room. We'll also look at how increasingly data is driving our work now and how it will drive it in the future. And we'll hear more about how data is used to shape public policy and legislation. Before turning to our first speaker, we'd like to play for you a 10 minute video. The video highlights the impact of our community's work through the voices of members of Congress and current and former inspectors general. This video will also highlight how our community has evolved since 1978, and we'll discuss some of the challenges we face and the overall significance of our work. It is my pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleague from the, my esteemed colleague from the Department of Justice, Inspector General Michael Horowitz, who is also the chair of our Council of Inspectors General. As the IG for the Department of Justice, Michael Horowitz oversees a nationwide workforce of more than 450 special agents, auditors, inspectors, attorneys, and support staff. Mr. Horowitz earned his serious doctor, magna cum laude, from Harvard Law School, and his Bachelor of Arts, summa cum laude, from Brandeis University. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, um, Carol, for that introduction, and thank you to the University of Chicago and Harris School for uh, hosting us today, and Professor Berry for uh, helping to make today's arrangements. Um, it's a great video, so hopefully we'll get to see it, um, but uh, I'm looking forward to chatting with you during my time um, of giving you a little background about the IG community, what we're about, and um, <clears throat> why it is a great place to work and a great career um, and an important career for people to consider. Um, I want to, um, I was going to start after the video, but you'll see the video and you'll think about this when I do, with recognizing Stephanie Logan, who's here from my office, um, who helped pull together the video that you will see later, um, and who's done a tremendous amount of work for us. And I want to recognize Stephanie not only because of the work she's done for SIGI, but for those of you thinking about a career in the OIG community, actually Stephanie started as a Pathways intern um, with our office just a couple of years ago um, and um, is now a full-time employee in our front office and having an impact already, even though she's at the start of her career, having earned a master's from American University in public policy. Um, and I'd encourage all of you, as <clears throat> we talk about what we do today in the IG community, for those of you who are here thinking about your futures and your careers in potentially in public service, uh, the path of people like Stephanie and others in our Pathways program and folks who come to us straight out of um, university, undergraduate, masters, um, law school, other programs, um, and how you can have such an important impact so quickly um, by um, coming in with the energy, with the effort, with the creativity that so many of our folks like Stephanie have done. Uh, there are lots of opportunity to do that, and I'll explain to you now for a few minutes um, why what we do is so important. Um, so important for the public um, to ensure accountability of federal government and in federal government programs um, and to um, 
create and hopefully instill confidence in the public that funds the government uh, that there are watchdogs out there looking over the programs that they are funding, that they're paying for, that they expect to work for them and for their communities um, in improving their lives and the lives of people around them. So uh, let me begin by talking a little bit about the 40th anniversary of the IGA uh, and the significance of it and the context in which it came to be. Um, as you've heard, it was October of 1978, October 12th, 1978, when President Carter signed the IG Act into law. That was a consequential year for reform of government, and I want to mention a few of those efforts, but they all, of course, come out of just a few years after Watergate. And they're really the legacies of Watergate and the legacy of a lack of confidence in government and people questioning the overreach, the abuses of power that occurred that were indicative or identified through um, the Watergate investigations. And what you saw, as I mentioned, is a series of good government, um, series of legislation, perhaps more that year than in any year in our modern history. Um, and we had for example, the Civil Service Reform Act that was passed just days before the IG Act. Um, that act created protections for federal government workers to ensure that hiring and personnel decisions were made on the basis of merit, on the basis of competencies, and not on the basis of political affiliation. The, the other thing that the Civil Service Reform Act did, very importantly, particularly for those of us in the IG community, um, is that it gave federal employees the right to blow the whistle on waste, fraud, abuse, and misconduct and to ensure that they were never retaliated against for doing so. Whistleblowers are critical to our work, as you might guess, as inspectors general, because as I like to tell folks, I have 450 plus members of the OIG looking over 110,000 people in the Justice Department. So while my staff knows intimately the operations of the department, where some of the weaknesses are, where some of the challenges are, they will never be quite the same as having 110,000 eyes and ears on government programs. And having those people being willing to pick up the phone and call my office, whether through our hotline, anonymously through writing, or more overtly, by reaching, out to, uh, or by reaching out to us in a more overt way. Um, that's critical, and our being able to go reach those 110,000 employees, let them know we are there, let them know that they can report to us what they see without fear of retaliation is critical. And so that was a very important part of the Civil Service Reform Act. Also passed in 1978 was the, was the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the FISA law that we've heard so much about over the last several years. That was actually passed in 1978, again, because of abuses of the use of surveillance for national security purposes that occurred and that were uncovered in that period in the 1970s. Also in 1978, the Ethics in Government Act, the law that requires uh, public officials in senior positions to file public disclosure reports. Again, because of concerns about conflicts of interest, that arose during that period, again, in many respects directly as a result of Watergate. So when you think about the IG Act and its passage in 1978, what you have before you is a time period when um, the, there was a true and keen interest in seeking to regulate, restrict, monitor, and ensure accountability of the executive branch's use of the various authorities that had been given to it. And it was because of that effort and because of those concerns that Congress passed this law that put us, our offices, inspectors general, in executive branch agencies and told us, we're not only gonna have you report to your agency head, in my case, the Attorney General of the United States, but also to Congress. 
and you're going to make your reports public, obviously with exceptions for where laws prohibit it from occurring, such as uh, if information is classified or protected by the Privacy Act. But otherwise, your default position should be make the information public, make it transparent. Make sure that your work demonstrates that people are being held accountable, particularly, obviously, in the executive branch agencies that we oversee. And in that manner, we as IGs, and through the work we do, can hopefully create a system and a structure where the public understands that abuses of power will be uncovered, will be covered hopefully at the earliest possible time, but even more importantly, will hopefully be deterred or prevented. And so we were given authority and independence to do our jobs by hiring a staff with a wide range of professional experiences, accountants, auditors, uh, investigators, law enforcement agents, evaluators, inspectors, lawyers, a wide range of professions. We are to hire them without regard to their political affiliation. We want top tier talent. We want the best people possible. And we need all of those professions in our organizations uh, to be able to move forward to do the kind of oversight work that the IG Act expects us to do. The law requires us to post our reports on our public websites absent a legal restriction. We do that. We have in the last year created a website called oversight.gov that puts in one place all the reports of all 73 federal inspectors general um, that post public reports. And we're doing that again to show the public and to create greater transparency. And the one thing that I'm confident of as we stand here today 40 years later is the effort and the push for continued and greater transparency will only uh, continue to grow over in the years ahead. The expectation, the demand that, that there be a transparency around government programs will simply increase. And that's something that we are critical, uh, we play a critical role in. Uh, so in October of 1978, 12 inspectors general's offices were created. That's all in the initial IG Act. 12. Today, 73. How did, and, and by the way, that's soon to be 74. Congress just a few weeks ago passed uh, a law putting a 74th IG over a smaller international agency within the executive branch. Uh, so how did we get there from 12 in 1978 to 70, soon to be 74 today? And as you, as we talk about that today, and as you see why that's occurred today through the examples of our work, uh, keep in mind that actually back in 1978, the IG Act was a radical idea. There were, there was pushback. We had a program at the Carter Center, at the Carter Library, back in October, a few weeks ago, and we heard from Stu Eisenstadt, who was President Carter's domestic policy advisor at the time, as well as Senator, uh, as well as Senator George Mitchell, who um, talked about rule of law issues and the importance of the IG Act to rule of law, and how important it is in today's world, the IG Act to show that the that the U.S. government stands for the rule of law. Uh, but what we heard and learned is that actually, during the Carter administration, there was pushback, arguments about whether the law was even constitutional, whether President Carter should sign it. Ultimately, he did. He couldn't go back on what was essentially a campaign promise to support more transparent and open government. But this was a radical idea at the time. Here we are, fast forward 40 years later, it's not so radical. In fact, it's not radical, I think, at all. We're in a city that has an inspector general. We have a county, we're in a county that has an inspector general. If you look at some states around the country, they have statewide inspectors general. I mentioned we've seen the growth from 12 to 74 of federal inspectors general. And why it is so significant what we're talking about today is this has truly been a transformative effort in overseeing the executive branch and the agencies that we're responsible for 
um, having oversight on. The, and the reason for this growth is the results that we've demonstrated over the years, the billions of dollars in savings, the various programs we've overseen and reported on to help them make <coughs> them more effective and efficient, and uh, truly a community-wide effort to do that. Uh, 10 years ago, Congress passed the Council of the Inspectors, amended the IG Act to create the Council of the Inspectors General Integrity and Efficiency. And they did that for the purpose of bringing the community, the IG community together. We had grown from 12, they said now to 74, soon to be. And Congress wanted to see us take this model to the next level. And they wanted us to do that by coming together more as a community, by thinking about whole of government issues. The government, as you, you are, for those of you in the public policy school, you know there's this tendency to look within your agency and look within your lanes and stay within your lanes. Well, in today's much more complicated world and much more uh, and, and growing federal government till this day and cross-cutting issues that seem to increase over time, issues that we find in the Department of Justice, other IGs are finding in their own agencies as well. And so the Council of Inspectors General was created to do a few things. To help train the IG community. Those 73 current IGs, we employ about 14,000 people in that community now. So we're there to train our own community. We've created standards for doing audits and investigations and evaluations and inspections. But we're also charged with thinking about issues that cut across the federal uh, executive branch. What are the issues, if we step back and think about big picture issues, that are challenging us in the federal government? And if you go to oversight.gov, you'll see a report we put out, in CIGI put out last year, that pulls together the top management and performance challenges that we've seen from across the federal government. You can, again, you can see that on our website, you can see some of the issues we've identified. And I, I present this all to you because we're here today to also recruit the future leaders into our community. We want to see those of you who do public policy work, if you're in um, the law school, if you're in undergraduate, we need, we need the future leaders of this community to be coming forward and thinking about careers in the OIG. There, it, it, it is a career um, that I think all of us here today, and you'll have a chance to speak afterwards at the reception with a number of members of the community who are here today. We're here to talk to you about their experiences um, and who can speak to you about the importance of their work in affecting positive change in the agencies that they oversee. In issuing impactful audits impact, and doing impactful um, investigations and in doing impactful reviews. Our auditors find issues in programs, some of whom find issues related to waste and fraud. Others find issues regarding national security vulnerabilities. And we make recommendations to our agencies to fix those problems. We have a direct hand in helping improve our agencies. And, and I like to, when people ask me, why did you want to be an IG? Why did you want to work in the IG community? I spent much of my professional life working in the Justice Department, working for many years as a prosecutor, first in New York City and then at Maine Justice. And I've seen the Justice Department. I have seen the important impact it has on the public's lives. It touches everybody's lives here in this country, in one form or another, whether it's helping make communities safer, whether it's preventing uh, future terrorist attacks, whether it's defending civil rights or prosecuting individuals for civil rights violations, environmental issues, antitrust issues, you go on and on. And <clears throat> what we do now, and what I get to, a chance to do as, as the Inspector General at DOJ, and what the 450 plus employees in the OIG get to do, is every day they go to work, and their mission 
is to do oversight that helps make that help makes the Justice Department more effective, more efficient, a stronger organization. And when you step back and think about it, if you want to affect change, if you want to go into a career or um, go to an organization that can make a difference, going to an IG office, whether, as you'll hear later, the work that um, folks did in the IG community that helped in working with federal prosecutors uncover the Takata airbag situation and, and affect change through criminal prosecution and criminal investigation. What we do is we go to work every day and we are helping improve the organizations that we oversee. And that's a great opportunity to be able to do that every day. That's a way to have an impact is you go forward with, if you've got a public policy degree, again, if you've got an accounting background, if you've got a liberal arts background, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for people who are committed to having that kind of change and to, uh, we, as we think about the next 40 years in our community, how are we going to build a sustainable community going forward, a stronger community going forward? And I want to just mention briefly my experience as a prosecutor in New York because I didn't come straight into, after law school, um, the IG community. I didn't, frankly, know much about the IG community in law school, which was a long time ago uh, for me. Um, but what I've seen since, and what I've learned since, is how important effective oversight is in any organization. And I want to talk about it just briefly in, in connection with my experience as a prosecutor in New York, where I ended up um, prosecuting police corruption cases in New York City. Obviously, an issue that this city has had to think about and deal with in terms of law enforcement. And I was a prosecutor in the 1990s. And at that time in New York City, the homicide rate was about 2,000 murders of year, a, a year. It's now, by the way, in the 200s. Uh, just to give you a sense of the complete change in policing that occurred in New York. But what happened is I got to the office in 1991, and I was in the public corruption unit, and there were a series of public uh, revelations at that point about misconduct in the NYPD, about police officers, particularly in impoverished drug-infested communities uh, where police officers were protecting drug dealers, working with drug dealers, uh, doing drug deals themselves, uh, famously resulting in initially the Michael Dowd arrest, a, a, a police officer in Brooklyn um, who was um, ended up at being portrayed in a piece on 60 Minutes back at the time. At the time. And there was a real question of can the, can the New York City police police itself? Why has the breakdown occurred? Why are there these police corruption cases? And the mayor appointed a commission that looked at that issue, and it found a breakdown in internal oversight in the police department. And the result was many of those cases came to me and my office, and I was the lead prosecutor, looking at police officers who were no longer doing what they swore to do when they put on the New York uh, the, the uh, blue uniform and became a New York City police officer. And I ended up, four years later, with a investigation of the 30th Precinct in New York, which is a precinct in Upper Manhattan, which at the time was a heavily, a heavily Dominican immigrant community. Uh, with a significant problem in terms of drug dealing and drug activity. Um, this was at the heyday or just after the heyday of crack cocaine. And the investigators up there identified the problem in a very interesting way. And this is sort of a lead into the importance of data analytics that I just wanted to throw out there for you. A, this is before big data, before some of the great sophisticated tools that you're going to hear from shortly that we now have. 
But the investigators from the Malin Commission thought, how do we look and see where there is perhaps endemic corruption in New York City? And then figure out why it occurred. So the first thing they did was they looked at data of where is the price of cocaine in New York City abnormally low? Where's that anomaly in the data? And they worked with the DA and they found a few precincts, including the 30th precinct, where the, there would seem to be an anomaly between the street price of cocaine in the 30th precinct, and if you know New York City at all, the precincts are relatively small, <coughs> tight geographic areas. Why this small area has a low street price of cocaine, but the immediate neighboring vicinity to the south, which perhaps wasn't as crime infested, or to the new north, which was probably e had an equal crime problem, higher. And their theory was policing had broken down, that the police were protecting the drug dealers, and therefore the cost of cocaine went down. Pure, right? Economics, this is University of Chicago, right? Demand, supply, the, the, the pressure on the drug dealers was reduced. They were freer to um, put their product out. They didn't have the cost of doing business anymore, potentially getting arrested. Um, and they went about their business. Well, it turned out, end of the story, four years later, of the 90 police officers in that precinct, 30 were implicated in drug dealing, false testimony, protecting drug dealers, payoffs from drug dealers, drug dealing themselves, et cetera. Roughly a third of the precinct. Including, by the way, the assistant integrity control officer in the precinct and the training sergeant in the precinct. Um, and what it brought home was the, how important data can be if you use it intelligently and creatively, and that'll be the tease for the later panel on what we're doing now, hopefully in a more sophisticated way than in the early 1990s, uh, but I know we are doing that more in the community, but also why oversight so important. So not surprising when the training sergeant is training people on how to engage in wrongdoing. Not surprising when the assistant integrity control officer is himself on the take, that oversight had broken down. And on top of that, the internal affairs division in the NYPD was not taken seriously and was not effective. And in some respects, wasn't supported by leadership in the way it needed to be supported. And so we came in as the feds and ended up doing these cases. And we, we had discussions with the police department about how they needed to improve their internal oversight because we couldn't be the internal oversight for the New York City Police Department. There are 40,000 police officers in New York City. We would do nothing but oversight work if we had to oversee them all the time. And so internal oversight, effective oversight is critical. With a breakdown in oversight, we get a breakdown in accountability, a breakdown in um, enforcement, a breakdown in compliance with the needs of the organization and the expectations of the organization. And what was so interesting about the New York City Police Department model is at the end of the day, I got to interview almost all of those officers because of the work we did in prosecuting many of them um, and interviewing and flipping some of them. And we didn't find any of them who went in to be police officers with the notion of tarnishing their badge and selling their badge and engaging in corruption. Various reasons they ended up in that position, but importantly from an oversight and accountability standpoint, they saw a path forward with little resistance and little oversight and little fear of getting caught. And that was the path, unfortunately, for the community they went down. Because the people who ultimately were harmed was the community they were responsible for policing, where drug dealers could op operate much more freely. And so we obviously, in the work we do, don't so dramatically, perhaps, day to day, have that kind of impact over local policing, 
But there are many areas where we have that kind of a dramatic impact and important impact, and you're going to hear about some of that today. My office, for example, oversees the <coughs> FBI, oversees the Drug Enforcement Administration, oversees ATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, oversees the U.S. Marshal Service, oversees the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, we fortunately have not seen that kind of breakdown in those organizations. But there are occasions, if you Google, you will find that we arrest FBI agents who have engaged in very serious misconduct, BOP corrections officers, DEA agents, et cetera. When you have an organization of 110,000 people, I don't care what their backgrounds or professions are, they're human beings and there's going to be failings there. And that's why the work we do is so important. So um, with that, um, I want to thank you for coming here. I hope you will talk, take us up, talk to us further during our reception afterwards about the work we do, what your um, participation in, uh, why you should consider a career in the IG community, what our members here today have found so valuable and so uh, positive from their standpoint and our standpoint in our career advancement and our careers. Um, and I don't know if we have time, but if we do, I'm happy to answer a few questions if anybody has that. I'm looking at the timekeepers to see if I'm allowed a couple minutes. I've got an end, so anybody have a question or two before I give up the podium? And if not, I'm happy to take questions later. not. Well, I, I thank you again to the University of Chicago and to everybody for being here today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of today's program. So now we're going to get on to the next topic, which is our use of data analytics. And do we have Angela Fontes with us? I'd like to introduce her. Lana. Angela will be moderating the second panel discussion regarding data analytics. She's the director of the Behavioral and Economic Analysis and Decision Making Program Area and manager of analytics consulting in the Statistics and Methodology Department at NORC at the University of Chicago. At NORC, Angela oversees academic, foundation, and commercial research focused on economic decision making and consumer behavior. Angela holds a PhD <coughs> in consumer behavior and family economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a master's in family ecology, consumer economics from the University of Utah, and a bachelor's from the University of Utah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you to City and the University of Chicago for um, hosting this event. I'm truly honored to be asked to participate uh, and very excited to introduce our three panelists who, as mentioned, will be discussing the use of advanced analytics. So panelists, if you want to join me up here. As folks are getting settled in, I'll introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, Tammy Whitcomb is the, uh, was appointed as the Acting Inspector General for the U.S. Postal Service OIG in February of 2016. Ms. Whitcomb has been with the U.S. Postal Service since 2005, serving as the Deputy Inspector General since 2011. Prior to that, she served as Assistant Inspector General for the Audit and Audit Director. Ms. Whitcomb started her career, her government career, at the Internal Revenue Service Inspection Service and transitioned with them as part of the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, established in early 1999. During her career at TICTA, she was an audit manager in Dallas, Texas for several years before coming to Washington, D.C. as the director of the Office of Management and Policy. She holds a bachelor's degree in accounting and business administration from W.J. Bryan College in Dayton, Tennessee, and is a certified public accountant a certified internal auditor, and a certified information systems auditor. 
Mohamed Adra is the Assistant Inspector General for the Risk Analysis Research Center of the U.S. Postal Service Office of the Inspector General. As the, as the RARC AIG, he is responsible for research that examines economic, business, and strategic issues pertaining to the Postal Service. Prior to his OIG tenure, Mr. Adra worked for the U.S. Postal Service in Pricing and the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And finally, Brett Goldstein. Mr. Goldstein is a, is a senior fellow in urban science at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. He earned his master's degree in computer science from the University of Chicago. In this role, he advises governments and major universities around the world on how to use data to inform smarter government decision making and leads research projects using big data and analytics to better understand urban ecosystems. He also advises Harris on the Master of Science program in Computational Analysis and Public Policy and works with the Computation Institute's <laughs> Urban Center for Computation and Data. He serves as a liaison to other major universities that are beginning to do research and teaching in urban science, generally broadening the reach and impact of activities here at Harris. Prior to joining Harris, Mr. Goldstein worked for the city of Chicago where he was appointed by Mayor Rahm Emanuel as the first municipal chief data officer in 2011. In this role, he led successful efforts to use data to improve the way city governments serve uh, residents and established one of the largest open data programs in the country. Mr. Goldstein holds a bachelor's uh, degree from Connecticut College and a master's degree in criminal justice from Suffolk University. So welcome panelists. So I think our first question for all of the panelists is, can you describe for us how you're using analytics to carry out either the role of an inspector general or improve government generally? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so at the uh, Postal Service Office of Inspector General, we started our journey in data analytics about 10 years ago. And actually, we started because of an event that happened um, in Chicago. Um, what happened was that um, mail delivery in Chicago has always been somewhat challenged, but about 10 years ago, um, it kind of all came to a grinding halt, and lots and lots of things kind of converged all at the same time. And the Postal Service um, sent a lot of people here to to untangle the, the problem and address it, and, and we had people in on that effort as well. And when we finished, we took, um, after we kind of took a month to settle, um, we said, is there anything that we can see in the data that might help us identify this and predict this um, issue uh, in the future? So we started studying data um, on, on mail operations. Um, we, we did some work then, we built a model, but then um, we quickly moved from kind of mail operations more into the investigative area because we really saw some real opportunities to make re real quick progress on uh, uh, analyzing data for investigative purposes. One of the areas that we've had real success in, in uh, data analytics, the Postal Service, is in healthcare fraud. The Postal Service has about a billion and a half dollars every year it pays out on workers' compensation payments. It's hard to imagine that kind of, of a workers' compensation bill every year, but the Postal Service has to pay it. And one of the things that we've seen is, is a lot of fraud in the program by healthcare providers. And so we've done a lot of work in that area. Initially, um, uh, we, get, we saw some real spikes in uh, pharmaceutical costs, and we, we tried to dig in deep to see what was causing those spikes in pharmaceutical costs. And, and uh, we saw that um, uh, a big part of those spikes were, was around compounded pharmaceuticals, where um, doctors were prescribing kind of tailor-made creams and that kind of thing for individual purposes, much of which was associated with fraud. And so we started digging into that and identified a, um, lots of cases, but we also issued uh, an audit report that, um, that found, um, and we worked very closely with, with Department of Labor and Department of Labor OIG in this area, and they issued a report, similar report as well for the program. But this report um, identified um, uh, about a, a billion dollars over time that would have um, been paid out if this issue had not been addressed, and Department of Labor and their OIG worked together to identify a, uh, a letter of medical necessity. Real, real easy fix, real easy fix 
surface control that basically took um, uh, a spike that had gone up to about $170 million a year just for the Postal Service down to less than $10 million a year in just, in just one year. We also do um, some really interesting things around um, mail theft. We, we look Postal Service, as you can imagine, delivering to every single house every single day has a lot of complaints from its customers. And so we do, um, we use uh, text analytics to look at those complaints and identify, we're looking for things like, um, like jewelry or gift cards or things like that, uh, those kinds of words in the data to identify where there might be some, uh, some mail theft by our own employees because that's what we investigate. When we, uh, we send out alerts every day to our mail theft agents on the street and oftentimes they see patterns when they get those alerts every day. They see particular carriers or particular routes that might be involved. And so they go out and do investigations. So this is some of the some of the ways that we use analytics every day. Okay, um, well let me, uh, uh, I'm also from the Postal OIG, and let me focus a little bit sort of on the research side of the analytics uh, in addition to sort of combating fraud. And what that means on the research side is really sort of promote the efficiency and the economy of postal operations, specifically look promoting the efficiency and the economy, not only on the cost side of the equation, but on the revenue side. And I think the best way to sort of describe what we do at Postal OIG is, let me tell you sort of in general how we uh, tackle analytics and give you a specific uh, example. The, the first thing is you need to have a, a question or a domain that you're probing. And in, in this case, the example I will give you, uh, you know, the general questions is the network of post offices. Okay, we've got over 30,000 post offices. And if the general questions you're probing is, well, do we have the right amount of post offices and sort of as a network? And maybe in certain areas, whether, whether it's rural or urban, do you, are you over-serving in certain locations and under-serving? Um, so that's one question. The other question is where well, even if you're serving very well and you have the right amount of uh, post offices, how are they doing financially in terms of customer service? So the first thing you need to have when you do analytics is you really need to have a question in place. I mean, that's just stating the obvious. The second part of it, which to me is just as a practitioner, is really the toughest and that may surprise you, is really how you collect the data. I know we live in the big data, and you, you've all heard the free, uh, freebies, the volume, there's a lot of it. The, f uh, um, uh, the velocity of the data is coming at us really uh, fast, and the variety. It's coming at us structured, not structured, and video, and data, and text mining. But also, you have to not overlook the other two Vs that I always add, the veracity of the data, how good it is, and also the value what insightful information you could get out of it. But really the second, what I mean, so not only you have to collect the data, you have also to make sure that there is a value, of it's valuable and it's, it's good data. And also you need to build something called analytical data set. The, uh, the data comes me uh, very messy. Um, you know, there's a lot of missing values Sometimes there's uh, data entry things, there's some revenue columns, doesn't make sense, it's negative and all that. <coughs> and that's usually 80% of what we do. It's really cleaning up the data. It's not sexy, but it's really <laughs> important. Okay, now let's talk about the sexy part. Um, <laughs> then after that, and I know the title of this uh, session is you know, user advanced analytics. So you've got the question, you clean up your data and you collect it, and then you apply to it analytics techniques and algorithm. My biggest thing here is that sometimes, you know, the not all analytics are equal. They're, uh, you don't always have to go through really sophisticated analytics to really get to the question. There are usually three categories. There's one that's sort of called descriptive analytics, summary analytics, and there could be as we look at the data, what's the min, what's the max, what's the average, where do you see sort of the frequency, if you were talking about post offices in terms of revenue and things like that. But also you could do a lot of sophisticated techniques and I could get into uh, some example 
um, predictive analytics. You could predict how much this post office should be performing in terms of financially. And also the highest level in terms of hierarchy of analytics is the prescriptive. You could really run analytics that would tell you what you ought to do. Now you that you've got the question, you've collected the data, you've run your analytics, whether it's a simple, descriptive, or advanced, what you really need to pay a lot of attention to how you present it. Whether you want to have a visualization or bow tie it to the customer. I always <coughs> say, let the geeks build the models, but don't let the geeks explain the model. <laughs> so there's really an art, the science of building these models. The last thing is you need to have a measurement system to tell you how you're doing as a program, but more importantly also how your analytics answer the question because you can go back and what we technically call calibrate the model and see how accurate it is or it's not. That's generally speaking sort of how we do it. Let me give you a quick example of post offices. So we needed to know how many post offices we need given the current demand for postal services. Okay, we have 36,000 uh, 36, post offices. Um, do we have the right amount? Do we have more or do we have less and all that? So one way we, we go about it is we've got transactional data. Every time you go to a post office and you go to a cash register, we've got that transaction. The value, the time, and all that. So we could really estimate the demand for postal offices based on that location. It's usually a function of do you have competitors, do you have a UPS store, do you have a FedEx store, do you have the population density, do you have income. So you run a demand equation and you figure out for that post office <coughs> the revenue should be 400,000. So that's your demand function. And then you could use that as a performance audit and then you go to that post office and just say well how much is generating? Is it generating above what it sh uh, sort of what it's predicted? Is it less? If it's less, it's underperforming. If it's above it, then you go in and say, is that a best practice? What's about it? Analytics also allowed us to sort of say, okay, for the best customer <coughs> service, how much square footage you need, what's the wait time, how many windows you need, how many employees, and the math solves for it. So really what gives you, it gives you really the standard and the criteria by which to judge how the post offices are doing. That's just one example of how analytics could help you. So I don't work for the post office. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a little jealous right now. Um, anyhow, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm gonna provide a different view. I come from the Silicon Valley world. I was one of the people who built a company called OpenTable. Um, I always like to see nods. Yes. Really good, good job. Um, and so I, uh, um, so I decided to leave Open Table and do. I'm a, I, I'm a computer scientist, right? So what you do when you leave Open Table is you join the Chicago Police Department, right? because that makes sense, and you become a B cop. Um, okay, well I did. Um, so I, I worked on the street for a while, and let's sort of talk about some of my observations about about data. So I went in completely naive because when you watch TV you see what cops do and they have like cool computers and, and things like that that wasn't real um, <laughs> and, um, so the use of data was really really troubling as a kid who's from suburban Boston going to Chicago PD I'm like yeah we're using Excel 97 that's good <laughs> um, and so there's some observations I'll take from there but after I you know I ended up making commander at the PD my job was um, Targeting, I was I was in charge of uh, using creating data intelligence products to identify where people would die. Again, not necessarily cheery, um, but it's um, the idea was: can you use this is an organization which was data rich but information poor. Um, it has like I bet all of our organizations really crummy data, right? Everyone's like, oh, the data is bad and it's dirty and what have you. But what do you do? Do you walk away and say, I'm not going to do anything? Or do you make the most of it? Um, and then later on, I was the chief data officer of Chicago. And, and thank you for the introduction. And it was a new position. And Rom was like, Mayor Emanuel was like, we're going to be the best in the city, uh, best in the country. And I'm like, what does that mean? 
And he's like, we're going to use data. What does that mean? And we figured it out. And there was open data and advanced <laughs> analytics. But again, you have this topology of all these departments which have their own data systems but don't talk to each other. And lots of data, data rich information for. Um, and so my career progressed through this. I did seven years in government. And, and some of the things I observed are one, we don't really know the difference between business intelligence and performance management and analytics, right? It's fine to have like KPIs are super and great, but that's really different than well, you know, trying to figure out what could happen next in your predictive models and, and things there. Two, we silo data. Like if there's anything, like I can be super boring, but if you take anything from this, we create silos of data and we create these functional bureaucracies within there when the data should talk to each other. And that's sort of, how do we do things smarter? Let's take, for example, the city. Um, there's this pattern, which is so obvious when you think about it, that when garbage cans are broken, the rats come. Like, that makes sense, right? Red Tito comes along and, you, you know, it's not good. You need to poison them. Um, so, but they're two different departments and they're two different systems. So why would the data talk to each other? So you pull out and you pull away from these things and you start to say, let's break down the silos between the data, one. Two, um, let's accept that data is imperfect and let's get over it. You know, like if we get into these binaries of either the data is perfect or it's not perfect and we don't use it bad on us because you want to know what? We spent trillions of dollars on these systems, use what we have, make it work, be smart about it. Three, and where I, I may have a differing view on things are, um, I don't always know what the data is going to tell me and I might not know the right questions to ask. There are patterns out there that we just don't think of. And when you start to have more and more data, you need to have an open mind to that. Four, as we are creating systems, um, we need to think about sustainability and being able to reproduce it. When we go and we create these systems that perform analytics that are so bespoke and so customized, and we spend $200 million on a vendor contract and it's not reusable, again, bad on us. And then the last sort of point that I took as I sort of built systems through the PD to working for ROM to sort of my afterlife here are um, follow open standards. Like one thing I can say, especially when I'm talking to a primarily government crowd, we're not really blazing the way here. Okay? <laughs> I promise you that. So if you think you are, and if, if you're sitting down and you're building an analytic system and someone's going to you, you need to build a highly customized, specialized proprietary. We'll kill that word, proprietary, right there. Just stop the meeting. Um, you're doing it wrong. Because most of the problems, I spend a lot of time hearing people describe problems. And there are templates for them already out there. We need to do a better job of reusing methods and systems that have been built by others so we aren't spending money on the wrong thing because we're not creating new math. I can promise you that. But there is code and there's always an excuse, so we can't use open source. We can figure it out. Um, but there are lots of things we can do so we can leapfrog and stop this nonsense of being so far behind in analytics. Great, thank you. So the next question, and I'll start, Mohammed, with you. Yeah. You discussed some of the ways that work is using data. What would you say are some of the do's and don'ts uh, for successful use of analytics? Um, well, let me, the, to me, the do is um, always have a goal in mind and always have a general domain or a question that you're probing. Um, the other do is the data sort of to go through sort of my hierarchy. It's not just about the data, the zeros or ones, if you're doing data mining or sort of by the text. It is, do you understand the business behind the data? Let me give you a specific example on the post offices. There is a certain business knowledge about how a post office uh, operate. So let's just take a simple thing as a revenue. And you may look at the data and you have a column that says revenue. You may have negative numbers, you may have zeros. You really need to understand the business of how they generate revenue. So for example, and I'm giving you a little bit sort of postal um, 
uh, inside information here. But the Postal Service say if you go in and go to a cash register and you buy a book of stamps, that's sort of revenue, they call it walk-in. But there's a lot of revenue also that comes to the post office if they drop off mail behind. That's also revenue, that's in a different data set. So another do is don't just go into and believe the data. You need the subject matter expert to really understand the business and the, inf the insight and what does it mean. Don't just follow the rows and, and, and columns in, in terms of uh, and all that. The other one is that, and I think I hinted at here, is don't just say if you have a more advanced technique, logit or probit model, logistic regression, and you know, a lot of this, that that could be, a, would give yield a better result. Sometimes the most, a more parsimonious technique could be really more efficient. So don't just get seduced by this is the latest uh, technique and it has you know, a fancy name and all that. But ultimately, ultimately also uh, an important thing is to really have a healthy skepticism when you're dealing data, especially in this big data area. I always say Let's the most- Let's take Westgarfield Boulevard, West 55th Street. Jim Mohammed. Location economics and more. The healthy skeptic, I always say the most exciting thing when you're working is not really the aha moment or eureka and I found the answer. It's really, hmm, that seems odd to me when I look at the data. So a little bit of healthy skepticism really, I think, yield better results than just to be seduced by the data or sophisticated techniques. Right, what would you say, do's and don'ts? So the do is understand what you're doing. <clears throat> and and that's, that may sound simple, but we have created enormously powerful tools and techniques. And I like to give this simple example. Like you can give someone Microsoft Office and they can do a regression. Okay, simplest thing in the world. Anyone can go home and do it. Is it a valid regression? If you don't understand what you're doing, you can produce, and I saw someone do this at City Hall. I'm watching them do it, and they're like, here's the magic answer, and I'm like, that is not magic. Um, so we need to make sure we don't just give people tools, but we also need to educate them. Um, because a tool alone at this stage of analytics will not get you there. The, the don't for me is, I'm gonna go back to my silos. And um, like earlier, Chris spoke to you folks, and, and Chris has been instrumental in our dual degree program. What's a dual degree, and that's part of the intro, it's computer science and public policy. So when I was in year one of working for ROM, I realized we had our IT folks, we had our stats folks, we had our policy folks, and they were all in their buckets. and. What would happen, there'd be some sort of analytic, but they weren't polished enough to be able to brief ROM, and we were not, we were actually creating all of these unnecessarily silos. So we created this degree program. And so we have people who can code, but also brief policy. And if we're thinking, when I think about government and I talk to other agencies, I talk about how do we, as we think about government 2.0, government 3.0, break down these walls, empower people with tools, but have that sort of combination. And I think we in government are often um, stuck in our own little swim lane, mm -hmm. and we need to do a better job of breaking out because it actually makes us a more effective organization. Tim, anything to add? The only thing I'll add on that is um, our, our do is, is a bit of a play off of both of theirs, and that is at least get the people in the same room. Like, I don't think mm -hmm. I could find the person that has both of those sides in the same body. Maybe you guys are training them, and hopefully you are, and we'll hire them at some point. But right now, we've got data people, we have pro programming coders, and then we have subject matter experts. And if we can get them all in the same room together talking, we'll, we'll be in a much better place. My, um, my don't is, is to play off something Brett said earlier. You can't just throw money at this and expect it to happen. Um, we, we kind of started that way in, in our office. We, we, we learned a lot through it, and, and, and I'm not sure I would have done it differently because we didn't have this skills and capabilities in-house when we started 10 years ago. But today, we're doing almost all of this internally with our own resources. We've, we've made tons of progress. 
Um, and, and contractors can be very helpful, but they can't do it for you. Speaking of that, we probably have some students here who are interested in working in analytics and government. Uh, what are the skills you think that they need to bring into these careers? Brett, we'll start with you. So, so if I were talking, there, there are students out there, learn Python and learn to brief. You, you know, straddle those world, words, uh, worlds and you'll be able to accomplish quite a bit. Um, and then spend time in both worlds. Understand the methods, understand the issues, put yourself into situations where you're completely uncomfortable, um, but be able to traverse it, and you'll be enormously successful. Tammy, what would you say? I, I love that, and I also think just being tenacious and curious all the time. Um, always looking for um, the question and then how to find the answer to that question. But, but I love the two, two sides of the coin, and I, I hope you guys are getting there because we need that. Mohammed, final word. Um, well, I mean, in addition to the obvious, you need to have some technical skills in, in terms of the, the, you know, the software, whether it's open source, R, Python, SAS, whatever, and you need to know a little bit about sort of the techniques, what's the regression, what's bullshit, what. But I also, there's the other soft skills that are really important. One is, look, you gotta have the intellectual curiosity. You've got this avalanche of data and you're really probing and probing and probing. The second thing that you really sort of soft skill, but really important skill, you need to have the communication skills. And I alluded to that earlier. Let the geeks sort of build the models, but how do you explain it? How do you bow tie it and, and deliver it? Especially if, if you're giving leads to um, you know, an agent or to an auditor or to a head of agency. Um, there's an art to it and you need to develop the art of sort of communicating technical um, uh, things. And, and then I mentioned earlier this healthy skepticism that would lead you to a better technique. Because remember, this world of the big data is not a deterministic world. We are not looking at the population and we know the, uh, uh, the answer. It's really a stochastic world. We're trying to estimate. I always have this cliche. I said, look, all of these predictive models are wrong. Some are more useful than others. So really having the healthy skepticism to determine so you do not really believe that you've got the final answer and it's the correct answer because we haven't done the whole population. It's all about sampling. So that's sort of my answer. Well, I know we're out of time, so thank you so much to our panelists here. Can I ask one, one question? Sure. Uh, I have a question about your opinion. Uh, I'm a criminal investigator for the post office, and I have, your question, I have a question uh, just to get your opinion about behavioral versus predictive. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I ask it, because at the Postal Service, we hire people with criminal histories that often we arrest with a, uh, that have worked for us for a very short time. They have multiple mail theft complaints uh, versus other complaints uh, that we all could overlay that data over. And it sounds a lot like what you were doing with the police department and targeting. Um, so I'd like to kind of hear your opinion about behavioral in metrics versus pr pr and how they might relate to predicted. Uh, so, so I spend a lot of time talking about the difference between person and place-based models. So I like place-based models because it's more tolerance of an error term. Now, with that being said, I do believe you can get quite far with person-based modeling on given enough parameters in the data. However, what you need, all right, so I'll give you the example I give everyone, and we are so over time. I um, apologize for the yeah. question. So, <laughs> that guy so I'm, I'm like, if you put me in, in somewhere and you're like, Brett, your job is to figure out whether my friend Chris is gonna kill someone, right? Which would be unfavorable. But, um, <laughs> and I come up with that a .98, that he is gonna do it. That's not good, Chris. It's but does it even ask who the person is? I mean, <laughs> detail. Um, so, th in, in that scenario, I've worked. I've worked hard. I have a good model, but I have a point zero two mm -hmm. balance. What does a point zero two mean? Now, in this case, it's really kind of awkward because we have a homicide on the line. In your case, there are some various decisions, and 
Um, one of the things that I think people don't understand well enough is the error term in these models mm -hmm. and how temporal attributes can be relevant to changing that error. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are an educated user of a properly constructed model that understands the error term with the temporal pieces in place, you're running a business and you're making the right choices and you're accountable to whomever you are accountable to. However, the majority of people I interact with don't understand that. Okay. So I think there's benefit to the models, but with any sort of algorithmic approach, I advocate education and internal scrutiny where appropriate, so you make sure it has rigor and validity and, and you can be comfortable with it. Great, well thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.